Hello everybody. Welcome back. Psychoderic here. The wind is just being an asshole today. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess we're supposed to be in like a high wind advisory um, tomorrow, so it's already acting up pretty early. Um, there's all like these wind chimes outside that are just distracting and not making this video process any easier, so it's like the second time I've had to record this and uh, hopefully this is the take that stays. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess winter's coming on, but and tomorrow's supposed to be like the coldest day so far for fall, so <sighs> whole thing just sucks. Well, anyways, I've um, got three online finds for you today, and then I uh, got three finds from Lincoln I found last week. Um, all good stuff, and so we shall dive in. I'm going to start off with this first one. This is Twink, Think Pink. This came out in 1970. This is an Akarma reissue. Um, I would definitely love to have like a sire pressing of this down the road, but um, I guess I just don't love it enough to like pay the price it's going for right now, which probably got to at least be over the 100 mark, you know, 150 I'm guessing. Um, I've heard this, you know, a Karma reissue sounds pretty good to my ears, to my stereo, but, um, you know, there might be some pressings out there that are kind of faulty. I'm not for sure on that, but um, I know this has been reissued a few different times, even by Twink himself, which got put on, like, pink vinyl, I think. Um, I just picked this one up because it was a good deal online, you know, under 20 bucks. And um, it does have, like, a little bit of warp on the cover. You can kind of see it there, but it's not too bad. And the vinyl plays VG+. Plus. Um, so, yeah, John Alder is the uh, man behind Twink, the nickname. And um, this album's had a pretty good reputation, I think, over the years. Um, I first discovered this one through the connection with Mick Farron, who produced this record uh, from The Deviants. Of course, I was a Deviants fanatic, like, you know, at least 10 years ago now, um, when I discovered Patoof and Disposable and their third album. Um, they were just records I'd play nonstop just because of how, like, freaky they were and just for how heavy they were at the time. Perfect depiction of what the underground UK scene was like at the time. And, um, I decided to pick up on this because it's just definitely one that takes me back. And I probably haven't heard it, you know, in full since then. It's kind of been a while since I've heard it. But I just remember it being very experimental, kind of spacey, very heady. And it certainly is. Um, this guy was just on another another trip. <laughs> um, it's all very freeform at times, and then there are some, like maybe two or three actually structured tracks on here. Um, as far as the rest goes, that like it's it just feels very like um, fairy tale inspired, and just a lot of acid dropping going on here. And this was also recorded in '69, but it was released the next year. Um, yeah, don't have a whole lot to say about it, except that, um, I think it does get kind of a lot of hype more than it probably should have. Um, I certainly like it. I think it's pretty solid, but I think, uh, the hype is kind of warranted when it comes to just, um, you know, you gotta listen to this, man. It's just like a psych rock masterpiece. Is it though? No. <laughs> I certainly wouldn't call it that, but... Definitely got some great moments though. Um, of course, the track 10,000 Words in a Cardboard Box, which um, is like a different, it's like a remake of the Aquarian Age track, which Twink was in. Probably my favorite track, Tiptoe on the Highest Hill. Um, it's kind of got, you know, starts out pretty moody and then it gets a lot heavier, heavier riffage going on. So, pretty happy to scoop this up for a good price. Then I picked up on this band. Um, been listening to them at work quite a bit. This is Crystal Siphon, Elephant Ball. Um, I have their first record. It's Both records are archival releases, um, so meaning they never got released at the time and got released decades later. Um, I definitely prefer the first one. This one is just slightly under par, um, but you know it's kind of expected when you have like so many tapes that were unreleased at the time, you only have so many, you know. 
you know, they probably have to start drying out somewhere, but um, this one still sounds pretty good. I, I picked it up for a reason. I was really enjoying it at work. Um, it does have a couple live sets going on there at the Fillmore West. Um, did, did a lot of gigs around there and um, down the whole West Coast, you know, gigging with some great bands. But I guess they wanted like full control and a lot of labels didn't want that to happen, so um, they kind of dropped them. And this one, this second one kind of reminds me more of a West Coast sounding HP Lovecraft. You know, definitely have a lot of those dueling vocal harmonies going on, you know, which kind of reminded me of them. Um, but it definitely has some of their strongest tracks, I think. It's um, still check, worth checking out, so. Um, Crystal Siphon. Um, I would recommend the first one, though, getting into them, but um, some pretty good production, nice hazy organ sounds. Um, this is kind of more of their jammy side, I would say. It's a lot more uh, um, longer constructed tracks on this one, so. You check it out. I think you can still find it for pretty cheap. Um, this is one I still have to get kind of familiar with, but what I was listening to online, I was really, really enjoying this one. Uh, the Liberty Bell. This is like a compilation of, I think, all of their single tracks and maybe like a couple unreleased cuts. It's um, recorded from 67 to 69. It's a Corpus Christi, Texas band, kind of associated with the Zachary Thax. I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty confident um, Hogs Ear Report shared this years ago, perhaps. Um, new cover, starts out with the cover of the Nazar Blue. You know, starting, it kind of goes chronologically, like how they progressed as a band. Starting, you know, more of a British invasion sort of sound, you know, more garage rock. Um, but by the time you get to side two, there's a few lineup changes, and they start to have like this kind of psychedelic edge to their sound. Really, really strong compilation here. Um, definitely worth seeking out if you're into the whole garage psych, you know, industry, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. Um, very, very reminiscent of like Zachary Thax, and I think they were trying to go for like a sort of New Colony 6 sort of sound. Um, you know, trying to kind of go that American patriotism sort of sound like Paul Revere and the Raiders, you know, kind of dressing up in those sort of uh, outfits and stuff. Um, it shows a picture of them here in court where they actually had to have some guardianship to get them to sign to uh, release these records because they were all minors at the time. Um, really worth checking out, especially if you're, like I said, into that kind of garage psych world, seeing how the band progresses. And this is on the Breakaway Records label. I think there was another compilation from the 80s, which om omits like maybe one or two tracks, but this is the most recent reissue and the sound quality is quite good. So I think you can still pick this up for cheap. I mean, I found it cheap, so i um, very happy to pick this up finally. Um, very, very good, the Liberty Bell. Okay, and then on to the local stuff that I found. So. Uh, Lincoln Vintage Vinyl, you know, he, he knows what I want, and I'm so appreciative that he's actually, you know, let me have first dibs at, you know, some of the psychedelic stuff coming in, and um, he sent me some photos, and of course there was some stuff that I kind of want, but, um, you know, some of them have kind of left me soft, or, you know, didn't really last too long in the impression when I first listened to them, but... This is one that I've been kind of searching for. I've definitely found it in the wild a couple times, but it's always been, you know, under under the condition I want it for, or doesn't include the inserts, because I kind of want them. Kind of getting pickier as I progress, but picked up on Daughters of Albion. This is on the Fontana label. Um, when I first heard this album, I thought it was kind of really lame. Um, orchestrated pop, you know, with no psychedelic flourishes at all. That's kind of my first impression, and when you look at this cover, you know, it just looks so dark and bleak, it's just, you know, not very interesting looking at all. Um, no, and of course you open up the Unipack, which we all love Unipacks, right? Right? <laughs> um, I need to get that glued, but um, otherwise it's in fantastic shape. 
Um, I forget where they're from. I think maybe the East Coast. I could be wrong. Could be very wrong. They could be from LA. I, I just I can't remember offhand. Maybe Chicago. Well, anyways, uh, Leon Russell is the producer of this band, and uh, he he takes a big hand in this project too. You can definitely hear resemblance of like the Asylum Choir, the way those this record and that one are made, kind of using the same effects, kind of the same writing style. However, since acquiring this one, um, I've definitely had a lot more appreciation for it now. Definitely in the Baroque pop vein, um, you know, slightly psychedelic in spots, but not overtly. Um, some pretty good pop writing, and this one just kind of grows on you the more you listen to it and you figure out like, wow, they're using a lot of different um, studio trickery going on, uh, the use of effects and whatnot. Uh, but yeah, uh, came out in 68, I think. And a pretty strong track, Story of Sad, was a highlight. Uh, Candle Song, it's kind of the more whimsical sunshine pop track. Kind of shares uh, male-female vocal harmonies. Fontana label, very clean shape. And I did pick this one up with the inserts. I'll be sure of that here. Um, I think these two were like a couple at the time. I don't know if they were married, but... Um, and I'm not sure if there's different, like, portraits, like these kind of fantasy, fairy tale like portraits of them. Um, if they're all different or what, but uh, I could see them doing that, you know, sneaking in, like, you know, three different portraits in each copy or something, but um, pretty cool. I think all of them came with, like, three inserts. Uh, some people compared them to Kurt Betcher's LPs, which... I don't think it's up to that standard, but it's still pretty good, pretty listenable. Um, I recommend it. Check it out. I picked up on these at um, Backtrack Records, which I don't go to very often because, you know, a lot of their stuff, you know, it seems like I never find stuff I want all the time, but just decided to drop in there, see what they, see what they had, and uh, this was in a box of stuff that just came in that day, so they hadn't even been priced yet. And as I was flipping through them, um, there's pretty good classic rock stuff that you don't see every day, you know. And then this one stood out to me. Camel with the Mirage. This is an original on Duran. And so far I've only listened to side one. This is an album band that I still need to get familiar with. I'm pretty sure they're associated with like uh, kind of a symphonic progressive rock sound. Kind of more on the hard side, maybe. Um, couldn't really tell you a whole lot about them just yet. Still trying to kind of dive into their sound. Very clean copy on Duran. Got this for a great, great price too. Um, he set up a pretty good deal with me on this one, under 20 bucks. So, um, pretty stoked about that. And then. Um, out of all these records, this is the one that's kind of like the black sheep of the bunch. <laughs> and maybe this maybe this won't uh, appeal to anybody, but this kind of appeals to me. This was just sort of like a fun pickup, something that I just spotted. And I was, I was just looking at this the other night because I grew up playing this video game. And um, I just thought, wow, it's, on, it's, a, it's the soundtrack on vinyl. It's just kind of unique. And uh, this is the Silent Hill original soundtrack. I think this came out, um, I don't know, maybe, I think it's been repressed a few different times. And this is on white vinyl. Sounds really quiet. Just kind of surprised. Um, color vinyl never sounds that great. I don't even know if I could show the gatefold. Uh, that demon's got some big old... But uh, yeah, pretty cool. Just, this is just kind of one of those fun pickups. Um, of course, I did pay up a little bit for it, but um, I used part of the trade money from last week, and there's the Obi Strip. Um, it's a Japanese composer. I forget his name at the moment, but uh, yeah, this was definitely a change of atmosphere when I was listening to it the other night. Um, there, there's kind of like some trip hop tracks, which are very cool. And then, of course, the Silent Hill theme is uh, really cool in itself, but um, as far as the rest goes, I mean, it would make terrific Halloween music. <laughs> and Halloween was around the corner, so I was just kind of like, I was just feeling it, you know? 
one of those blind pickups that you just, you gotta take a chance on. And I don't know how long it's gonna last in the collection. It was just kind of one of those spur of the moment purchases. And um, some of those video game soundtracks are actually pulling some good money right now. So could always flip it. But yeah, um, that's all I got for now. I think I got like one online find coming in yet. Um, I just ordered last night. And uh, that about does it. So I may or may not do a video mix. Um, there may be one coming up shortly. Um, I got kind of the albums compiled so far, including those two. So um, take care, and we shall see you soon.